This morning we'll begin worship with uh, a moment of silence. Let us pray. With joyful hearts, we gather here on the shores of Lake Michigan to worship the one who is the waves breaking, the children laughing, the birds singing. We seek for grace, we seek for mercy, we seek for the joy that is the God that we worship this morning. Amen. I've got some uh, special backup singers I heard for this night. I'm not sure I've gotten my money's worth. So. so if the mood strikes you, feel free to chip in on me. Okay, the world survives for another day Not thinking about eternity Some kind of ecstasy's got a hold on me Had another dream about lines at the door I wasn't as frightened as I was before Got my mind on eternity Some kind of ecstasy's got a hold on me Coming through you, being me and I'll be you together in eternity. Some kind of ecstasy's got a hold on me. And I'm wondering where the lions are. 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 So sweet down in the valley where the river from me got my mind on eternity. Some kind of ecstasy got hold on me. Huge orange flying boat rises off a lake. Thousand year old petroglyph does a double take. Point his finger at eternity. Well, I'm standing in the middle of this ecstasy. Shining in the sun, polished and precise like the brains behind the gun should be. And I'm standing in this ecstasy. And I'm wondering where the lions are. Wonder 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 where the lions are. These days gonna sail away, gonna sail to eternity. And this ecstasy's got a hold on me. And I'm wondering where the lions are. Wonder 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 where the lions are. I'm wondering where the lions are. Wonder where the lions are.
morning to those who are seated there. Fred, thank you for joining us for the service of worship. We especially welcome those of you who are guests or with us for the first time. Only two more services down here at the beach, uh, sadly. Uh, next week, uh, I'll preach, and Don Sternberg, a uh, gifted mandolinist, will be here. Uh, he's always spectacular. Uh, that's next week. And then in two weeks, please take note, I guess it's the 17th? Yes. 17th. Uh, one service at 10 o'clock, and that will be uh, a potluck afterwards. And so bring whatever kind of food inspires you and puts a smile on your face, and then we'll all just sort of... Uh, Dig in, and that service begins at 10 o'clock, one service. I want to say thanks to uh, Terry Moran for awesome music. Now, last but not least, you know him, you love him, uh, Elliot Gelman has an announcement. Oh, yes, right. Oh, yes. It's time again for the ukulele class. Oh, it's the perfect instrument for every lad and lass. So come on and sign up and get up off your couch and play, play some ukulele with me. <coughs> we're starting in September and we'll go until November. You only need to remember the chords of C and G. We'll sing your favorite songs and it won't be very long until we're playing ukulele. Don't have to practice daily. <laughs> And play some ukulele with me. <laughs> if you're uh, interested in uh, coming to church office once a week and having a blast, uh, Elliot is the person to see after the service, or uh, check out the website, which will have something uh, on there shortly. Uh, great way to spend time. So the Dancing Bohemian School of Youth that uh, Elliot leads is starting up again. In his best-selling book, Essentialism, uh, writer Greg McEwen uh, interviewed Nora Ephron. You know Nora Ephron's name. She's a well-known writer. Uh, she wrote film screenplays for When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle. And in reflecting on her life and on her skills, Ephron points back to a high school class she took her freshman year, Journalism 101 at Beverly Hills High School, with her teacher, Mr. Sims, and she said that that experience shaped her life because it taught her to find in a story or an experience what it is that <coughs> mattered most. Now, she tells in this book, Essentialism, of her first assignment on her first day of class in this Journalism 101 at Beverly Hills High School. Mr. Sims, Explain the concept of a lead in a story, what matters most. And then he read this. Now listen to what Mr. Sims read to the students as they're trying to find a lead. What would you say is the lead for this story if you were writing for the Beverly Hills High School newspaper? <laughs> Kenneth L. Peters, the principal of Beverly Hills High School, announced today that the entire faculty of Beverly Hills High School would be traveling to Sacramento next Thursday to attend a colloquium on new teaching methods. Among the speakers will be anthropologist Margaret Mead, college president Dr. Maynard, Robert Maynard Hutchins, and California Governor Edmund Pat Brown. Well, picture the students in your mind hammering away on manual typewriters, trying to listen and keep up, make notes of what mattered most. The lead that they came up with, and most of them turned in, kind of went like this, and he read them to the class. Margaret Mead, Maynard Hutchins, and Governor Pat Brown will address the faculty, dot, dot, dot. He shook his head, put the paper down. Next one reads, next Thursday, the high school faculty shook his head, put the paper down. He read through all 25 in the class, and he said, everyone is wrong. He said, the lead for this story for the student newspaper at Beverly Hills High School is this, there'll be no school next Thursday. <laughs> Sim said journalism isn't about regurgitating the facts, but instead it's about figuring out the point and what matters most. Now, of course, being a preacher, my mind actually takes the leap to faith. 
in the spiritual life. And the question is, as you think about your faith, your spiritual experience, what matters most? Beyond the chance to be with your friends in this sort of Norman Rockwell-like setting, why are you here? Why do you open the Bible once in a while? Or say a prayer? Or think about your faith? What matters in the spiritual life most for you? Now store that question in your memory bank for just a moment. Let me share one other story. It also comes from Essentialism. A team of students at the vaunted Stanford D School, D stands for design, were in a class called Design for Extreme Affordability. And they were given this challenge to design a baby incubator for 1% of the typical cost of an incubator you'd find in the hospital, which is about $20,000. Why? Why the challenge? Because in the developing world, some 4 million low birth weight children die within the first 28 days of their lives because they don't have enough body fat to regulate their temperature. McEwen writes, if those students had raced into that challenge with it primarily being a cost problem, they would have produced for 200 bucks, which was within the 1%, an inexpensive electric incubator. A seemingly logical solution. My guess most of us would head that way, but they would have failed miserably because they didn't figure out what it was that really mattered. What they did was they went to India and they went to Nepal to understand the situation. And in those countries, low birth weight children die regularly. They discovered the reason why. It was because 80% of the children are born in villages, villages where they don't have electricity. So what really mattered was providing warmth without electricity. The result, well, the team won the competition for the class. They received some funding. They won some prizes. They launched a company called Embrace. They launched the Embrace Nest, which uses a small wax-like substance that you can heat in boiling water for a period of time, and then you slide it into a little baby-sized sleeping bag they call the nest. It can keep an underweight infant warm for up to six hours at a time. The $25 nest in the last nine years has helped over 200,000 children, little infants, stay alive. All because they took the time to sort through what was most important in that challenge. They figured out the real problem that needed to be solved. What matters most, asked the journalist, trying to fashion a lead for a story. What's the problem we're trying to solve, asked the Stanford D School students. Which takes us back to the question I posed just a moment ago. For you, what matters most about faith? Is it about a problem you're trying to solve? Is faith the kind of framework that helps you figure out how to live your life and make decisions? Is faith a means to solve a problem that's plagued you, maybe because of a mistake you've made in the past? It's the one way that you can be free. Or is faith something that just kind of feels right to you because you've been doing it most of your life? Chew on that question for a moment or two. We'll come back to it. Thank you. 
give uh, the Apostle Paul kind of a hard time 2,000 years later for some of the things that he wrote which are hard for us to, difficult for us to understand in a sort of 2017 context. Uh, but forget about what Paul wrote for a moment and think about his life and this extraordinary transformation. As a young man, he was absolutely devoted to one thing which was trying to stop the spread of the Christian church. Paul was involved with a group of other people in the death of Stephen, who was the first deacon in the early church. And then he has this amazing change. Everything changes for Paul. And he devotes his life instead to... Uh, Kind of being part evangelist, part marketing guy, the reality is, is none of us would probably be here were it not for Paul and how he spread the word. Well, what's amazing about Paul is throughout his life he had struggles, he had problems, he had this weight of what had occurred in his past hanging around his neck. Yet somehow he was able to still have a peace and a joy no matter where he was no matter what he was doing. The words you're about to hear were written at the end of his life while he was in prison from his letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Make your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, 
think about those things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in, to, in me, put it into practice and God's peace will be with you. Amen. So a moment ago I shared two stories. The first about Nora Ephron and her journalism class with Mr. Sims at Beverly Hills High School and about their learning to write leads, trying to figure out what was most important in a story. And then I pose the question, what's most important for you when it comes to faith? And then I shared an inspiring second story of a Stanford D School class where the students were given a challenge to help underweight preemie infants in developing countries. They wisely figured out what the problem was they needed to solve. It didn't have anything to do with money, but instead a lack of electricity that mattered most. And so now as for your faith in mind, the question is, what matters most? Beyond this setting, why are you here? Why do you think about God? Why do you pray? Why does it matter? And I submit there's not just one answer to that question fitting with our sort of open-minded, our decidedly open-minded approach to faith. I think that there are a multitude of reasons why faith matters. For some, it provides freedom from past mistakes, what others call the wages of sin. For other people, it gives hope for life beyond this life. Still, for others, it's a framework for how to live and how to make decisions and how to do this life. In the next couple of moments, I want to provide just <coughs> one reason. My guess it fits for most of us on why faith matters. And I think it's because it helps us stay on track amidst the illusions that often steer us in the wrong direction. Recently, while on a long ride, I listened to a TED Talk by David White. David White is from the British Isles. He has this fabulous accent. It's one of the most popular recent TED Talks. It's out there if you want to listen to it or watch it. And David White says that there are three illusions in life that most of us embrace. The first is this. We believe that we can somehow construct a life where we're not vulnerable. That you and I can somehow create a life where we're immune to difficulties and ill health and problems and conflicts and hassles and ill health and losses. That we can position ourselves beyond vulnerability. That we can be insulated because we're smarter or because we're wealthier, or because we're healthier, or stronger, or we work harder. Now to do that means we pay no attention to the natural world because there's not a living thing that doesn't have cycles, that doesn't have ups and downs and ins and outs, right? Even 25 years of marriage, ups and downs, not all this, all up. <laughs> You're moving in the right direction for another 25 years of Jack talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Challenges. Every part of life. Twelve days ago, Michael Shea, 63 years old, strong, healthy, good guy, PhD, University of Chicago, smart guy. His life had made a turn in such a positive direction recently. Twelve days later, he's been flat on his back for the last five days fighting for his life, surrounded by machines. We somehow think that if we're wise, we work hard, we're wealthy, we're smart, we can become not vulnerable. Second illusion, that somehow you and I can construct a life where we won't have our hearts broken. Now the first thing we think about is, is the romantic life. 
White offers that one of the primary reasons we choose someone as a life partner is because we want to have someone we're confident won't break our hearts. And he says, in most cases, it will be broken. But it's not just about our partners. He talks about our kids and what it's like to be a parent. He says, if you're a parent, your child, your children are going to break your heart. And he says, usually they don't even do anything dramatic or spectacular, but sometimes they do. And then he goes on to talk about life as a parent. He says, you know, your children live with you as spies and saboteurs for years. They watch your every psychological move. They note your every weakness. And then one day, when they're maybe 14 or 15 years old, you're somewhere like the kitchen. Your back is to them. You're probably cooking something for them. And then, when you least expect it, the psychological stiletto goes in. And you say, how did you know exactly how to hurt me like that? Where to place it? And they say, I've been watching you for years. <laughs> Somehow we think our wisdom as parents, our professional personalities, our life experience, our armor will insulate us from having hearts broken by our children. It doesn't happen. Two of my dearest friends in this world I've known for, for 50 years. I was with them this past week. She's a PhD social worker. He's a PhD therapist in the town we grew up in. I grew up in in Glen Ellen. Uh, they are known and well loved by the and respected by the entire community. Well, they have two boys who, while in high school, they're both great guys and both have wonderful families now and high school students themselves. But when they were in high school, while mom and dad were away, they made the choice to have just a little gathering at their house. <laughs> You've heard this story before, probably, in your own lives. And the gathering became more than just a little gathering. And in fact, the police stopped by. And then the story of that event was in the Glen Ellen newspaper, what's called the Police Roundup. And there were my friends, these community leaders, well-respected, their names in the Police Roundup, which was frankly quite humiliating. So as the story is told within their family, my dear friends read their two sons the riot act. And when they were all talked out, when they couldn't yell at him anymore, their one son, who now happens to be a therapist, <laughs> looked back at his dad and his mom, and he said, I'm so sorry we've ruined your perfect parenting profile. <laughs> In went a stiletto. Our hearts will be broken. White's final illusion is somehow we can plan in a way, somehow we can manage our lives so that we can take wherever we find ourselves right now and we can look down the path of our lives to the end and we can see exactly how it's going to work out and we know exactly what's going to happen between here and there. Even if you were in the desert, you couldn't do that because of the curvature of the earth. We can't see that way into the future. Hasn't every one of us had surprises? Things haven't worked out, and we somehow just have to keep on keeping on. I had a conversation with a, someone I've known my entire life, and he was talking about his plans for retirement. And he's got just the place to move to in Florida. And he was talking to his accountant, and his accountant said, you know, statistically speaking, the very best time to retire from a social security standpoint is 66 years and four months. That's what the tables indicate. So he's decided to, you know, at 66 years and four months, he's saying goodbye to his job and moving from central Iowa 
Florida. He's got it all mapped out. You know, they say if you ever want to make God laugh, just share your plans. <laughs> what do we do with these illusions? These notions about life that we embrace that are as real as the day is long for us. But the reality is we can't have ironclad protection against pain and difficulty and loss and struggle and disease. If you care about something in your life, you and I are not going to avoid heartbreak. And we can't plan our lives perfectly from now until the end. But what strikes me about all three of White's illusions is that they all seem to be about yearning to have peace in our lives. Desperately wanting peace and being able to live day in and day out in such a way that we know everything's going to be okay no matter what. We can't buy our way to peace. We can't manage our way to peace. We can't manipulate our way to peace. We can't become so strong that we're assured of peace no matter what. The best we can do is open up our hearts and our lives and find a place for the Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. The best we can do is find a place in the life of the Spirit for us. And each and every day, find a place. Find the people. Maybe people like you. Maybe a place like this. Where you can breathe deep and I can breathe deep. The peace that's available to us through the Spirit. Amen.
Friends, we're out of the world today and enjoy this wonderful gift called life with which we have been blessed. And know that there is a kind of peace available to every one of us for the very asking. Claim that peace. Enjoy the day. And the people said, Amen. Amen. I'm one of my lions on